Okay, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit. I'll do a little bit of general information. I'm happy to answer the questions as they come up, too. I know we have a little bit of a full house here today. So let's see if I can. Here we go. Okay, so I told you a little bit about me. I'm new to the area. I came from Chicago, but I grew up in Tampa. And I'm one of the, uh, the few people in town who really specialize in hip and knee replacements. There's a couple of us other ones out there. And what that means for you guys is that I, I do both the primary joint replacements, which most orthopedic surgeons do, as well as the revisions, the redos, which are a little bit more complicated. And I kind of do a little bit of everything. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of buzzwords out there like minimally invasive surgery, anterior approaches, arthroscopy, and you know I can do my best to kind of talk to you about what that may or may not mean for you as a patient and what is more marketing from industry, marketing from doctors, and what really may or may not be important for you as, as you're considering having your hip or knee replaced. And then rapid recovery, I think, is the, is the ultimate goal for everybody, getting back to what you were doing. And that's why we do this. These are all elective procedures. It's, we're not talking about cancer. We're not talking about something that anybody has to do anything with whatsoever. But if you're making concessions with your daily activities, you're having pain, you're not able to do what you want to do with, then you talk about potentially having a, a joint replacement. So uh, I'll ask, how many of you have arthritis of some sort? Ever been told you have arthritis? So here they come. <laughs> right. Arthritis, arthritis is not what I would consider a disease, although that's kind of the way it's perceived by people. There are all different kinds of arthritis. There's rheumatoid arthritis, which is different than osteoarthritis, which is different than post-traumatic arthritis. And all of these have different implications. But at the end of the day, what you have is pain and stiffness and swelling. And so having arthritis of some kind, I would consider part of being human. And we're all human here, at least last I've checked. So I don't think there's any real problem with having a little bit of cartilage wearing out. That's what arthritis is, and that's what happens over time. And what osteoarthritis is, which is the most common, I won't talk about all the different kinds because I could be here all day. Osteoarthritis is the wear and tear arthritis. And what that is is just the ends of your joint surfaces start wearing out or thinning. And then you get exposed bone, which hurts more. You have swelling and pain. All of the bones, at least the bones that we're talking about in the large joints, are covered with a cartilage cap, which is a nice smooth cap that keeps things gliding smoothly and pain free. Over time, just like the treads on your tire wear out, the cartilage wears out. And it doesn't regrow, at least not normally. And that's what arthritis is in a nutshell. Um, it's slowly progressive. I've heard it all from it. You can feel it when the weather changes or it hurts more in the nighttime or the daytime or it gets better as the day goes on or it doesn't get better as the day goes on. At the end of the day, arthritis doesn't always follow the book and it can act different ways for different people. Yes, sir? Do you find that more with uh, people that are runners and uh, athletic? Yeah, you know, you, there's a lot of different people you can blame and activities you can blame for osteoarthritis. I like to blame parents just because it's an e easy thing to do. You know, yeah, you know, you can have an old injury while you're playing football, or you could have an old injury as a couch potato. Or your parents had arthritis and need knee replacements when they were 30 years of age, and now you do. So there's a genetic component that we're not necessarily sure about. Some of it has to do with your alignment, the way your weight is distributed throughout your body, how much you weigh, what kind of activities you've done all these sort of things, and it's kind of multifactorial. So it's not easy to blame one person or one thing. But certainly, if you've had an injury in the past, that can set you up for arthritis. Just like the treads on a tire. It's the easiest way to, to imagine it. We've all had to change our tires. And that's bas basically what happens with our knees and our hips. Really, anywhere, our lower back, our fingers, it's all the same. But the ones that take the, the brunt of your weight are the ones that are more affected by it. We talked a little bit about the clinical presentation. And it's fairly routine. I hear it you know, in different extents. Some people have more pain. Some people have more stiffness. Some people have more instability. And you can have instability in your knee because when you feel a shock of pain or your knee is swollen, it doesn't move normally. And it kind of gives out on you a little bit. 
And that's what I hear typically. The other thing that you can see, especially with the knees, is changes in your alignment, where you notice over time you're getting more bow-legged or more knock-kneed. That's because the knee may wear out preferentially on one side or the other. So you get more narrowing on one side of the knee. On that last slide, uh, did you tell about the colors they were representing? The colors. Here? The red, yeah. So this is exposed bone. This is a graphic presentation of it. But all it means is exposed bone. So you have wearing out of the cartilage. And this is just a dramatic, a a dramatic picture showing bone on bone arthritis. It's red because it hurts. That's not what it looks like when you look at it you know, in, in the operating room. And I'll show you a picture of what it looks like. So who gets arthritis? Like I said, yes, sir? What about stem cells? Have they experimented with uh, stem cells? Yep. Does it work? Kind of. It does work. You know, there are ways to regrow cartilage where you can take some of your cartilage cells or your chondrocytes, which are your stem cells that regrow cartilage. And does it work? Kind of. It works for someone who has normal alignment in an isolated pothole, a small one that's not in your kneecap area for the most part. So like, I, what I'm basically telling you is it doesn't work for most people. Is it better for the younger? The younger uh, Usually it's for young athletes, and it kind of works. It works pretty good. Is it perfect? By no means. And most people who come and see me in the office are well beyond that stage where a stem cell would work. Now, if you think about it, doing this is pretty archaic if you think about it. You know, the, the stage in medicine we're at now where we have lasers and robots, and all kinds of advanced medicine and genetics. I have to sit up here and tell you I'm going to have to chop your knee off and put in metal and plastic. But that's what we have, and you know it works great. I think in about 30, 50 years, we'll get to the point where we can give you an injection and regrow car cartilage. But we're nowhere near that yet. Cartilage is one of the most complicated structures in the body. Now, my friend's a cardiologist, and he thinks I'm hilarious for saying that. But I, I really do think it's not just a smooth layer. It's three-dimensionally different on every layer. There's different orientation of it. And if you just put a blob there, it ends up being like patching a pothole. And it wears off, it flakes off, and it's never quite normal. So it's a very difficult thing to regrow in any sort of way. And we're nowhere near that yet. Yeah, I love giving that to people. <laughs> it, I feel like I'm like some sort of, you know, miracle worker because, you know, especially the first couple of times people come in, oh my gosh, I'm better. Yeah. What I'm doing is masking the symptoms. It doesn't treat, it doesn't regrow cartilage. It, it's an anti-inflammatory and a pain medicine more than likely what they're giving you. Cortisone is a generic term for an, a steroid and an anti-inflammatory. Probably some marcaine or lidocaine or something that numbs you up a little bit too and it can work for months and months and months and some people can get on the rest of their lives with the the, the injections usually that's not the case and they 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 stop working as well yes sir you're talking about getting a, a diverted there the more you get the more possibly breaking your cartilage down in the long run you know cortisone is a generic term that most doctors say when they talk about a steroid injection. There's all different kinds of medications. Some of the medications that you can put in a cortisone shot are detrimental. They're not perfect. But mo the reason why we do it is because it masks the symptoms. All medications have side effects, and certainly some of the medications can cause problems with the knees or hips or whatever. And I'll talk a little bit about the injections a little bit more in a couple minutes. So we talked about this a little bit. Arthritis is normal. It's part of being human. If you get x-rays of people at different age groups, you'll see more and more arthritis, even people that have no symptoms whatsoever. So that's an important thing to know. No matter what your x-rays look like, if you're feeling great, walk out the door and never go back and see the doctor again. I could care less what your x-rays look like if you're happy. If you're pain-free and you're happy, that's the only job of an orthopedic surgeon, OK? I don't care what your x-rays look like. So 
let's go on to this. So now we'll talk about treatment, which is why everybody's here, because everyone's had some sort of treatment or you're thinking about some sort of treatment. The first, second, and third options are not this. That's at the end of the road. There are certain things we can do not to regrow cartilage, because we can't do that, unfortunately, but to mask the symptoms, to treat the symptoms, and to make you feel better. So weight loss, every pound of weight you take off the body exponentially, or at least three to four times, depending upon what joint we're talking about, takes that much pressure off of the joint surface, and it makes a huge difference. Now, there are plenty of people who over, are overweight because they're having daily pain from their extremities, from their joints and their arthritis, so they can't exercise. So it's a vicious cycle, and I understand that. And I don't have a weight in mind that I say you're okay to have surgery or you're not okay to have surgery. Uh, to me, if you're having pain and you can't get by, no matter what your weight is, it makes sense to have a surgery. But will you lose weight after the surgery? The studies don't bear that out. Some people think, well, once I have my knee replaced or my hip replaced, I'm going to lose all this weight. I wish that was the case. You may feel better, but you may not lose much more weight. So these are kind of two difficult, conflicting <coughs> things. Other things are exercise, physical therapy, and that may help strengthen the knee and take some pressure off the knee, and it works limited. It's not, the, it's not magic. It doesn't make people feel tons better, but there's some people that really feel better with the therapy. And then there's anti-inflammatories, injections, and canes, and crutches, and all kinds of other things that really are cumbersome. There's no brace that I can put on your knee, certainly nothing I could put on your hip that would take the pain away from arthritis. People wrap their knees, they have all kinds of braces, some of them are quite expensive, and they really, for the most part, don't do a whole lot. They don't treat it, they don't prevent it or slow down arthritis, we know that for sure. Yeah? Uh-huh. It's funny, you know, I, I, n that's not necessarily true. Now, there's some people that just have arthritis everywhere. Now, there's some people that have a terrible left hip, and everything else is pretty normal. So I, I can't just say that for sure. You know, arthritis kind of is funny in that sense. You know, if you have a terrible, terribly arthritic both hips, and you're not moving normally through your hips, you become one of these waddling kind of people like ducks, where you kind of waddle through your back because your hips don't move. <coughs> And then you start aggravating your lower back. But I can't say for sure that if your hips are bad, that your knees are bad. I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's fair to say. So surgery. What do we do? What kind of surgeries do we do? If you're younger, you can try and do realignment surgeries because sometimes if your knees are really bow-legged, you're going to wear out the inside of your knees more. So you can straighten the knees out, but that only works before you have arthritis. After you have arthritis, I think, the horse is out of the barn a little bit. Then we talk about partial or total knee replacements and hip replacements of some sort, a resurfacing, a total hip replacement, something. So before we get into that, I'll talk a little bit about the non-operative stuff. And we've all seen the pills, horse pills, dog pills. I mean, all these pills. You know, the first time I came into contact with glucosamine and chondroitin was for my dog. I have a 110-pound Labrador retriever who now has arthritis, and my veterinarian told me to try glucosamine chondroitin 10 years ago. And I saw how much it cost, and I had to think about it for a second. And I gave my dog the pills for a little while, and I think it helped a little bit. But then again, the dog was very overweight, and, and you know, so I can't say for sure that glucosamine and chondroitin helps. There's been no real valid study in the medical literature that says it helps. I don't think it hurts you. It's a vitamin. Theoretically, it nourishes your joint surfaces. I tell people to try it. If you feel a difference, that's great. The most recent study I've seen compares glucosamine chondroitin to a sugar pill, which is a placebo, and there's no difference. When someone tells me that they're much better because of the glucosamine chondroitin, I'm, I'm not going to argue of course, you know, anything. I have no treatment that I can give other than masking the symptoms. So if you think that it's helping you, I would be the first to say that it probably is helping you. Um, don't believe what you see on daytime TV about some of these pills or whatever else, especially the things you see on airplane magazines that are going to read new your knee or whatever. There's nothing out there that I'm aware of, and I would have hopefully found that by now. 
Um, Anti-inflammatories work by treating a side effect of the arthritis, which is inflammation, and they are my go-to medicine. I prescribe it like candy, and most people feel somewhat better for some time. There are side effects of anti-inflammatories. And then there's, you know, if you have rheumatoid arthritis, there are some very good new medications out there that can control your disease. Question. Yeah. Uh, assuming that uh, you have bone on bone contact here with the hip or the knee, mm -hmm. uh, how long can you live on something like naproxen? Uh, and <laughs> it's a great question. <clears throat> you know, I, I call it a vitamin for some of my patients. There are side effects, so certainly there are things that we have to watch. But I don't think there's any limit, shelf life, of how many years you can take anti-inflammatories. So if it's helping you and it's not causing any harm, then I think it's OK. Certainly, you know, your primary doctor will order some tests to check certain functions on you. And there are risks of these things. There's no question about it. It's medicine. You know, so I wouldn't just take a handful of them at a time, because they can cause some harm to you. There can be kidney problems. There's heart, and heart issues that we know about. And the, the biggest one that we know about is, is upset stomachs, ulcers, that sort of thing. So they're not magic, and they're not without symptoms. But for the most part, people can tolerate them pretty well. Mm -hmm. oh, on, the, on the bone yeah. the contact, I've heard of uh, spurs. Bone spurs? spurs. Yep. Yeah. Now, is that going to get progressively worse until? some point where you just have to do something else? Never. No. Never. You never have to do anything. Well. Never. I'm, I'm not saying that lightly. I mean that. Right. There's People ask me that all the time. If I let this go, is something bad going to happen to me? No. I mean, yeah, the only bad thing is you're going to be making more concessions in your life. It may be harder to do the things you like to do, and life may be a little bit more di difficult to, to deal with, okay. which that's bad. But it's not like a metastatic cancer that if we wait on, you know, bad things happen. Right. This is totally different. This is a lifestyle and, and a happiness kind of thing. Well, my mother had this bone on bone mm -hmm. surgery because she was doing the surgery. Yeah. So one day she couldn't stand on that stuff. Absolutely. Now, you know, if you get stiff enough, you may not be able to walk or ambulate the well, way you want to. You may aggravate your lower back. You may not be able to do all the things you like to do. And then that becomes a personal discussion that I can help you with and maybe give you some expectations of what you may expect after surgery, but never do you have to have surgery. I would never tell someone, and it's time, you need surgery. It's something that everyone has their own <coughs> limit for. Yes, ma'am. I actually had surgery about six months after I got out, and my pain wasn't going to get any better because I kept thinking to myself, I want to be active. Right. Well, for somebody who does these for a living, I would agree with you. But I, because I see how great people do from them. You know, I'll talk a little bit about the risks of surgery because there are risks and I think everyone should know about them. But for, for when I see how people change their lives after, and a lot of times there's this fear. It's almost like a mourning process where you have to mourn your old knee before you're ready to move on and get a new one. And everyone has a different, you know, different I just spoke to a lady today in clinic who's seen five different doctors who've all said she need an, she needs a knee replacement and I think she's waiting to hear she doesn't need a knee replacement which is what I told her she doesn't need it she can have it if she wants it yes the, the trickle down I had that's a low back uh -huh. I had to pay there yeah me. yeah but now my left hip is mm -hmm. covering my back mm -hmm. my left knee and foot yep just like what she was saying in the back, when you have arthritis, your gait is off. The whole body is kind of out of whack, let's say. And when you're walking differently, you put more pressure in different parts of your body. Now, also, if you have back arthritis, more than likely you already had hip arthritis to begin with because usually people don't just have one thing. You have a little bit of el everywhere. And then once you start changing the way you walk, then you really aggravate things. So it's kind of a, 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 a cycle. Yeah. Does it uh, affect your internal organs? Does arthritis? Yeah. What do you mean by that? Well, 
Well, uh, if you're changing your gates or you're hunching over and things like that, it, it, it would seem to me it would, uh, you know, put your organs uh, where they shouldn't be. If, you know, everything, you know, in extremes, yes. Now, there are people that have terrible backs that are bent over like this, and they have problems breathing. But, you know, for the most part, I wouldn't worry about your visceral organs from arthritis, at least not unless it's something extreme. But, you know, everything's possible, and I've seen terrible back arthritis, not hips and knees for the most part, though. Yes? What about that gel injection? That yeah, so that's... We're about to get there right now, so let me get to that. Yeah. So here are the injections. And what I, would, what I classify the injections as is two different kinds to make it simple for everybody. There's the cortisone. When, I, when you hear the word cortisone, there's about 20 different inject, injectables that can be put in your knee. Um, then there's the goo, the, the gooey stuff. And there's a bunch of different ones, and the, the manufacturers are coming up with all different ones. Some of them come from rooster combs. Some of them are, are uh, synthetic. And basically, the gooey stuff basically tries to mimic the normal joint fluid in your knee. It's like an oil change. A healthy knee has a nice thick, we call it, it's, it's called a synovial fluid. And when you get more arthritic, it becomes more watery. So the idea, in simplistic terms, is to give your knee an oil change. And it works kind of. It doesn't treat anything. It doesn't regrow cartilage. But there are some people that love it. There's some that you can give one time. There's some that you have to give every week for five weeks. Some that you have to give every week for three weeks. And there are risks of it. It's a foreign material, and you can get an allergic response to it. It costs some money. Some, some insurance companies don't approve it. And it's not magic. Just like the cortisone injection, it's not magic. <coughs> But there are people that love it, and it makes you feel better for a while. Currently, it's not approved for hips. I don't usually do hip injections. I kind of felt that's what you're about to ask. Um, I don't nor Cortisone and steroids. Yeah. Uh, Neuroblock. Wow. I've had them, and I, the, the allergic reaction is a whole lot better. So hip injections don't last as long or as, as reliably. I do injections for hips more than likely for diagnostic purposes because hip pain is very commonly mimicked by back pain. And a lot of times, people that have hip arthritis also have lower back pain. And I can't tease it out. If you have a bad back and a bad hip, which is causing more of the problems? So sometimes I'll numb it up, and it'll be a diagnostic exam, where I'll have you keep a journal, and you'll tell me over three days how much of your pain is better. And this also gives you a kind of a sneak, pre a sneak preview of how you'd feel with the hip replacement. It doesn't last long. It won't last like the knees last. It usually only lasts a, a short period of time. Sometimes people last longer. And I usually tell people that want it for pain management, uh, I, I'm not sure it's going to last as long as you would hope it to. Um, so that's the deal on the hip injections. Now, there are some people that have pain on the side of their hip. And that's different. That's a bursal pain. That's not the joint pain. And I do those all the time in the office. So injections, questions? Any other questions on injections? Okay, so now we're on, that's it. That's pretty sad. That's all I have outside of surgery. It took me five minutes to talk about. Does that sound like work at all? Yeah. Because I've had three surgeries on my knee. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Two exercise, three toric, and then you do scar tissue, and you go in, and oh, two, in five years, I was going to need a knee replacement. Are you from New England? And I still don't have <laughs> So, so for the cortisone shots twice a year, yeah. try that gel. That's a reasonable thing to do. When the cortisone doesn't work, it's reasonable to try it. I will tell you, though, once the cortisone doesn't work, it's very rare to find the goo working better. We're kind of at that point of diminishing returns, and then we start talking about this. And that's a good segue to when is surgery right. Surgery is never right if you don't want it, especially when we're talking about elective well, surgery. <laughs> so the reason why we do surgery is when the other things don't work. And so there's plenty of people like you who have tried it all and are not happy, fed up with the injections, they're not happy. There are plenty of people that have the injections and they're so happy. They're back to what they want to be. And then you don't talk about surgery. 
But when you're not feeling good after the injections, after the pills, after the PT, you've done everything you can, then we talk about these sort of things. And this is my segue into what I do for a living, which is joint replacements. And I'm assuming that's what most of you all are here to talk about, is what you do for knee and hip arthritis when it, go, when it goes bad. And this is a knee replacement, and the idea of a knee replacement is similar to what you do when you crown a tooth. You remove the ends of the bone, you, you shave it off, and you cap on a metal cap. There's all different ways to do it, and I won't bore you with the details of different ways, but the most common way is to cement it on. The metal is a kind of a complex metal. It's not one kind of metal. It's usually a combination of different metals, or what we call an alloy. And you do the same thing on the tibial side, or the leg side. You put on a metal cap, and there's a removable plastic surface. It's not like hips where there's ceramics and all different kinds of things. Every knee replacement has a plastic bearing surface. This is called polyethylene, and over time this will wear. Just like everything else wears in life, every time you bend on it, you're grinding on that plastic. Now this plastic is getting better every year, and I'll talk, I have a couple studies that tell you how long you should expect it to last. And I think that they're lasting longer and longer as I'm seeing these newer plastics. So that's a knee replacement. And, that. Yeah. Uh, once the, the uh, polyethylene wears out, do you replace just the polyethylene? Or? It depends. Okay. It depends. You know, I do a lot of redos. And if, if things are getting loose, then you replace everything. But if it's just plastic wearing, which is common, but not that common, believe it or not, um, then you just replace the plastic, and that's a very simple procedure. You don't see that as commonly in knees as you do in hips. I, I do plenty of hip plastic exchanges. So this is a hip replacement, and hips are a little bit more complicated. There's a lot more ways to do hips than there are knees. A hip replacement, the actual stem has a million different designs, literally a million different designs. You can cement the stem in, you can just press it in, which is, which is the more traditional way of doing it in the United States. There's metal balls, which is what this is. There's a ceramic ball. The cups can be cemented in or not cemented in. Most of the time, it's not cemented in nowadays. This is the plastic, which is very similar to what's in the knee, in fact, identical. You can have ceramic, you can have metal, and there's all different reasons why you do one or the other. And basically, this is what a hip replacement is. Any questions on the general idea of the surgery? Yeah. Is it a good idea to have both hips uh, replaced at the same time? Um, it's a good idea for the surgeon because <laughs> more surgery. <laughs> I, you know, it depends. Most people would say no. You know, especially if you're doing a posterior approach, which is the more common one, you'd have to flip you over and do the other side. It's a bigger operation, and most surgeons would recommend against it. But, you know, that's a discussion you could have with your doctor, depending on what the circumstance is. When you're doing an anterior approach, for the most part, you're laying flat, and it makes it a little bit more easy logistically to do it. The bilateral surgeries, knees or hips, is a kind of a plus-minus thing. Some doctors are very um, okay with doing them. Some doctors have issues and reasons for the issues of it. And so I would talk to whoever you decide, if you decide to have surgery, about that. Yeah. To do a second time around? Well, you were just saying that the, in the knees, the plastic wears out. Uh huh. In the hips now, what wears out here? The same. The plastic wears out. Is it more difficult? I, you know, I, that's what a large part of my practice is redos. So when they wear out or something happens, I re, I'll yeah. take care of it. Yes, it's a bigger surgery than the first time around for you. It's a little bit longer for me, but is it more difficult? I don't think it's more difficult. It's 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 just different. Mm-hmm. I like to make people match just because it looks cute on x-ray, but yeah. it doesn't matter. No. It doesn't matter. Right. Yes, you probably would have to have a redo. Um, 
It doesn't matter if you have matching sets. No, there's no like, it's not, they're not like magnets that are, your legs are just going to stay apart like this. So no, it doesn't really matter. Yes, sir. Oh yeah, that's one of the risks. Absolutely. His question was, one of the risks after having a hip replacement is dislocation. Yes, that's probably what's well, the second most common problem after hip replacements. The most common cause of problems, litigation, lawsuits, whatever you want to call it, depending on who you are, is leg length problems. And in my opinion, it's almost almost always female patients that have the problem. One of, and the reason why there is a leg length discrepancy is because when you do the surgery, you do your very best to make the legs the same length. The hip, one of the ways to stabilize the hips is you have these big tendons called your abductor tendons. And they keep the hip from, from dislocating. When you cut the neck out, you cut out some of the important stabilizing structures of the hip. It doesn't matter if you go from the front or the back, what approach you take, you will destabilize the hip in one position or the other. If you, dislo if you do an anterior approach, the hip is less stable from the front. So if you do a posterior approach, it's less stable from the back. But the short idea of it is to make the hip more stable, sometimes you have to lengthen the leg a little bit to put more tension on the abductor tendons to keep the hip stable, to reduce the risk of dislocation. So back to why women have more problems than men. Well, when you have a small leg length discrepancy, we're talking about millimeters here. The easiest way to accommodate that and not feel it is to stand like this, which most men do anyways. Most men don't stand like this. Females stand like this. And if you have a tiny little leg length discrepancy, you feel like you're going to fall over. And so I could tell my female patients that feel that, that you can stand like this, but that won't happen. So what normally is the case is it's not a real leg length discrepancy. It's what we call a perceived leg length discrepancy. Over time, arthritis grinds your hip down, and the bad hip becomes shorter. You may not realize that. And when I see you in the office before surgery, I show you this. Look, your leg is shorter. Do you feel shorter? I feel tight and I feel painful, but I don't feel short. So in the, in, the, in the time of an hour when I do the hip replacement, I'm doing my very best and I'll get an x-ray to make sure we're just about even if we can. Um, I lengthen you back out to what you used to be. And your mind takes six, eight months to catch up to the fact that I've now made you even because you were thinking you are even all along. So that's what the most common problem after, after hip replacements is what we call a perceived leg length inequality. In, you say that you do quite a few redos. Yes. What is the situation that predominates among those cases? In other words, what is it you have to repair? Oh gosh, you know, hip redos, could, that's one of the reasons why I like doing it is because it could be anything. It could be from infections to instability or dislocations to plastic wearing to the cup loosening. I mean, there, you name it. It could be an old fracture or a new fracture. There's all kinds of reasons why you have to redo a hip or a knee. But the kind of previous operation doesn't come up as a, as a category. Are you talking about the approach to the surgery? I, you know, I don't think so. I think, I think you're, you're still you're talking about the approaches, one being better than the other. And I certainly think that there's a lot to be said about the anterior approach. Out of full disclosure, I don't do an anterior approach for the most, the, most of my patients. I do what's called a posterior approach. And there's, there's pluses and benefits of that. For my revisions, I always do a posterior approach, no question about it, because you get better exposure. You can see everything you need to see. Is there more of a revision rate with anterior or, or posterior approaches? No. There's not. There's been studies on that. In fact, when you first start out with the anterior approach, there are, there's a higher risk of needing to do things over again because you're not comfortable with the approach. So if you're doing an anterior approach or if you're dead set on seeing someone that has, who's doing anterior approaches, I would make sure you go with someone who's comfortable and has done a lot of them because there's a learning curve to it. No question about it. Yes? Um, how about my back? My left leg. My leg is sore. Yeah. 
Vic is working out. Uh huh. And they've done physical therapy. I've done chiropractic to, uh, to rotate back. Uh huh. Into the, in, into the position. That's why they, they say my left leg is shorter. It's because my hip keeps rotating or shifting. I, I don't know. It's not coming out of socket because if that was the case, I would be able to walk. Right. I mean, I'd have to see you get x-rays and see exactly what's going on. It's, it's hard to so really... My left leg is shorter than my right leg because of the... You, you know, come in and see me and we can figure it out specifically. It's kind of hard to, to guess. Okay. okay. What's the average range that it, um, for the plastic to wear out between... You are the best. You keep giving me segues to these. <laughs> it's perfect. Or, so joint replacements are great and it really... You know, this is like where I can get, uh, you know, get up here and, and tell you how great of a job joint replacement does. When you look at it from, uh, someone asked me what the MPH is and it's for a master's in public health. I like to look at things in the big picture. And there's no surgery that we have in any country which for buck for buck is a better surgery. It gets people back to doing what they're doing, being productive and out, and out of less work. It's a wonderful surgery, and, and for the most part, there's not much we can do to improve it other than get rid of it, which is my hope. Someday, I'll laugh with my grandkids about how I used to have to cut hips off. But that's what we do nowadays. And it's a wonderful surgery, and these are too. And you know, it really has proven long-term dur durability, way longer than any car you'll ever buy nowadays. So if you want to look at it that, you know, you were asking how long do they last. I think if you asked somebody 10 years ago, they'd say it lasts about 10 to 12 years. I think that was the normal response. Some studies that, that we looked at recently have shown that at 20 years, 90% are doing great. Now of those 10%, that doesn't mean that the 10% are having revisions. It just means that there's some issues you know, 20 years out. So a number I, tr I try and maybe tell people is 20 years. And it all depends on your activity levels. You know, if you're a paraglider and you know, you're trying to do these crazy activities where you're really pounding those joints, it's going to last less. But you know, how many cars do you know that are around 20 years from now? 90% of the model. There's zero. Oh, so the, Hertz. Huh? Hertz, she's got a 20 year model. She's got a 20 year model. <laughs> she's going to drive it into the ground. Perfect. Well, that's great. It's a rarity nowadays. So if I was shopping for joints the way I, I am with cars, I'd be much happier when I'm buying a car. Yes? Nope, they're all different. It's all that's that's capitalism, and it's 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 nice. You know, everyone is different, and there's TV ads that you see about the 30-year knee and the circular knee and the woman's knee, and and it's confusing, I think, for for people. It's confusing for doctors because none of this stuff is really based on science, at least not real science. It's based on marketing and getting more of the market share. Um, there's different plastics, and that's my job as, a, as your surgeon, is to figure out which has the best track record. There's been problems with joint replacements, as I'm sure you've seen on, on TV. Some of them don't work as well as others. But even the ones that we have seen that have been recalled still do pretty good. They have a slightly higher than expected loosening rate, which means that for the most part, they're still doing good. They're just not doing as well as the other ones that are on the market. So I, I think Having a joint replacement, I wouldn't get too caught up on which model, which brand it is. I, I would make a side note about the metal on metal. I think that's a little bit worrisome, but that's just me. Yes? The slide that you just showed before, it had one push up at 80%. Yes. And it had three letters. Oh, okay. TKA is a total knee arthroplasty. I'm just so lazy, I can't write that out every time. And I've had to written that, write that out for years now. So TKA just means a total knee arthroplasty. Arthroplasty is a joint replacement. Okay, arthroscopy is a scoping. Arthroplasty is replacing the surface. And THA is total hip. So these are just reasons for surgery, and I think we've, been, we've already gone through this. You don't have surgery if you're not having pain. Why would you have surgery? The only time I would ever consider that is someone who's so contracted from arthritis that it may make sense because you can't walk or you can't see straight or something. But that's pretty un uncommon not to have pain. I, I have a question of, of, about uh, helping the pain. Does, uh, 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 no, I forgot the darn name of it. 
<laughs> Acupuncture? Acupuncture, thank you. Does it help? Does that help the pain? Sure. No, he said no. No, he must have had it done. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever he says. I had it done. It worked one bit. Yes, no, maybe. I'm the opposite. I've had a temporary. All of the above. Yes, no, all of the above. I, 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 it depends on how big of the needles they put in, I guess. I don't know. I, you know, when I have a patient that comes in and they want acupuncture, they want, you know, you know, Eastern, Western medicine, they want to have steam massage, whatever it is, as long as it helps you, great. You know, chiropractic manipulation. I'm open-minded to any of it if it helps you. Does it help you? Sometimes. Sometimes not. You never know unless you try. So go get some acupuncture. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, he can do it. He'll do it for you. So function. This makes sense. If you're not able to do what you want to do, if you're making concessions on a daily basis, then it makes sense to talk about it. And these are all things I hear about. I'm not able to walk upstairs without instability. I'm not able to walk more than a couple blocks. And I hear the concessions in people's minds, which really makes me upset in some ways. You know, I'm not having pain but now I can't walk to the mailbox. That's an extreme one. Or I was having, I'm not having pain now, but what are you doing? Well, I'm not really doing much of anything because it hurts. So it's kind of like, well, yeah, you're not having pain, but you're not doing anything. So the idea with knee and hip replacements is getting you back to normal activities. I'm not one of the guys up here who's going to tell you you're going to be a triathlete after this. I don't think it's a great idea with joint replacements to do these crazy activities because they'll wear out sooner. If you want to do that, there are certain activities that I, and I do want you to be active after your knee and hip replacements. You know, doubles tennis, bicycling, swimming, all these things are great. Jogging is terrible. I'm a, I like to run, and I'm killing my knees right now. I'm going to be up here talk, listening to somebody else soon. But it's a terrible thing to do after you have hip and knee replacements, so I wouldn't recommend it. But I want you to be active afterwards, and that's why we do this. Golfing? Golfing is wonderful, as long as you don't <laughs> do anything terrible like hit your golf ball into someone's window or something no it's one golfing is exactly what else you should be doing and walking while you're golfing and all that sort of thing so that's the picture someone was asking that graphic picture that's what if I was doing a knee replacement that's what an example of a pothole looks like there's no bone there's no cartilage there and that that dark spot is the cartilage that's gone and there's bone there yes how much time between the time you're done with the surgery and get out of surgery till you get back to uh, normal? Uh, that's, that's hard to say. Well, there's got to be an average. Yeah, there is averages. And, you know, some people absolutely defy the laws of gravity, and they're flying through their rehab like there's no... And I never can tell by looking at somebody. Well, how long is the rehab? So rehab is different for every person. If it's a hip replacement, I'm not, I'm not trying to walk around it. If you're having a hip replacement, there's not a whole lot of rehab. No matter what the therapists tell you, the only rehab I need from a hip replacement is to have you walking without falling over. I'll tell you about certain precautions. I don't want to put your hip in so you don't dislocate. And that you know, is reasonably you know, about six, to, six weeks to two months. That I really want you to be real firm on that. And, and that's not the case for anterior approaches, for, for the anterior approach guy here. Um, there's less of the, the positions that you have to worry about with that, which is, in my mind, the great thing about an anterior approach, is you don't have to worry about this thing here. You can, you can do that. You have to worry about this thing here. You can't do this with an anterior approach. So it just depends on what position you don't like the most. Uh, I'm just kidding. It, well, it takes driving, for example. Yeah. So driving is a perfect example. After hip replacement, getting in a car, it puts your hip at most, that's when most of the dislocations happen right after surgery. Because when you get in the car, you do this. That's precisely the wrong way to get into a car. So they'll teach you how to get in this way, back in. And that lasts for two months, and then you're fine. Assuming the hip was stable, usually there's not any issues. And that's the second most common issue after a hip replacement of every kind. Um, is there less of a chance of a dislocation with an anterior approach? Kind of. Kind of. I wouldn't say, oh, yeah. If I said, oh, yeah, I, I think everyone would be, would be doing anterior approaches right now. There's kind of a difference, but not statistically significant. It's hard to say. 
It, it makes sense in some ways. In general, is the dislocation issue only in the postoperative or the vascular? There's two times. Two times when there's high risk of dislocation. The first time is in the, po the first six weeks. That's the number one time. After that, like 15 years later when the plastic wears, So if you look at this, it's a nice snug fit. There's no wiggle on the cup. But as the cup wears out, it kind of what we call subluxes. And when it does that, because the plastic is worn out, there's a bigger space, it can dislocate. So we see two different peaks, right after surgery and down the road. OK. X-rays mean very little. And MRIs mean less. Some people get x-rays and MRIs and they come in with a stack of things. I, you know, the biggest thing I want to hear is about your function, what's going on with you, and I can tell you what your x-rays are going to show just by looking at your knee. Hips are a little bit hard to tell, but all they do is confirm what you're telling me. If you're having tons of pain and your x-rays are normal, well then that's, then you've got to go down the path. But if you're having tons of pain in an arthritic knee, it just kind of, it just kind of is like the period at the end of your sentence and it makes sense. So. They just confirm everything and they kind of go along with preoperative planning. But I, you know, everyone asks about what are bone spurs, what are narrowing, what's bone on bone, and that's really what you see on x-rays. So let's look here. I'm going to zoom in. This is the thigh bone right here, or the femur, and this is the leg bone or the tibia. And when you zoom in on a knee, you see this dark space here. This is a normal knee. That's where the cartilage is, that's where the meniscus is, that's where all the healthy structures are. On x-ray, you don't see the stuff that we're talking about. We, you don't see arthritis. You see results of arthritis. And so they look pretty normal to me. That's what a good, healthy knee looks like. Now, this person here has a nice outside of their knee. The inside, there's really no space there. The bone's on the bone. Bone on bone arthritis on one side of the knee. So this person, if is only having pain on the inside of the knee, nowhere else, maybe would be a good candidate for a partial knee replacement. And that's the type of person I would say, someone was asking about who, when, how long they last. This person, if this was it, may get by the rest of their life with just a partial knee replacement and be very, very happy. And that's what a partial knee x-ray looks like. I don't think I'm going to go into, I have a whole talk about why you would do a partial knee replacement, how great they are, how sometimes they're not great, but you know, if you're considering that, come and talk to me or speak to your orthopedic surgeon and we can talk a little bit more about it. I think that's just a little bit too much for this talk. So when it's more than one side of the knee, the option is pretty simple. It's a total knee replacement and it's reliable. 90% are doing well at 20 years. And this is an x-ray of someone where there's no joint space. There's, it looks like the, the knee is basically fused. That's a very extreme example. Most knees don't look like that. But that's what an x-ray of a good position knee replacement looks like. So then there's the question of minimally invasive surgery. What's minimally invasive nowadays? What's not? I don't know what minimally invasive is. I actually trained where this whole thing came about, rapid recovery, where the small incisions were developed. This was in Chicago at Rush. And I think I practice minimally invasive surgery because I trained there, but I don't even know what that means anymore. It's like one of these overused terms that every surgeon says they're minimally invasive. Because what surgeon's going to say, I'm a maximally invasive surgeon? <laughs> you, 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 let me see your knee. I'm just going to whack it away. You know. So every surgeon nowadays says, I'm minimally invasive. It's a useless term. I think the idea is, is to try and keep the normal stuff from being touched. And if, if the doctor's doing that, then in my mind, they're minimally invasive. So there's ways to do that, and it makes no difference what the size of the incision is. The only thing that's cool about the small incisions is that re, at the therapy, you know, the patients can, can say, oh, look at my, my incision smaller than yours. And so that's about it. It makes no difference long term. <laughs> yes. Uh, when you were around people knee, and once in a great while, you could actually just drill through there and hear it pull. Yep. What's that a sign of? Nothing. That's the normal knee replacement. So 
the knee that God gave you has tissues and ligaments and they're fairly soft, but even those knees, normal knees, natural knees, click. Mind you all the time. There you go. All the time. So I have people that come in and tell me that they're, the knee that they were born with is clicking. And if that's a problem, and my answer is the same, it's normal. That's called crepitus and that's normal, that's part of being human. Can you show us what happens on the show, on a knee replacement? What I do is I replace all those normal structures with plastic and metal. You hear that? Can everyone hear that? Um, that's what happens. When you're bending your knee, the plastic and the metal click. That's the way it's supposed to function. If you don't feel that or hear that, that means that something isn't engaging. Or you just have a perfect knee and you're lucky. So everybody feels a little bit of that. Some people, for the first couple months, really annoys them and then they get used to it and it becomes their new clicking knee. Yeah. That's completely normal. I wouldn't worry about it. Yes. The what? The closure? What do you mean by that? What do you use for it? Great. That's a good. That's a fair question because there's some doctors who are so busy running between that they don't actually do the closure. Right. I personally do all my closures because I agree with you. I think it's, and I'm a little bit meticulous with it. I even do an extra layer because my I'm a very uh, I lose sleep over infection. Let's just put it that way. It's one of the things I just really hate. I see a lot of it coming to me from other places because I do the redos and an infected joint replacement is a big issue. And um, so I do everything within humanly power to keep infection to a low risk. What it's not infection, but more scar tissue. I, I, I understand what you're saying, and I agree with you. It is important. So what do you do for infection? Yeah. Do you have the hospital uh, blow air up above you, or whatever space suit? Yes, yes. You know, we operate in what's called laminar flow. We wear a space suit. We give you antibiotics. We hope and we pray. <laughs> In spite of all our best, <laughs> yeah, you know, that helps. Yes, we do. So there's, there's no way to, to completely get rid of the risk of infection, even in a young, healthy person. Now, if you have diabetes, if you, know, if you have other issues, you know, it, the risks go up. They go up from there, and I think you have a realistic discussion with the doctor about what he or she may feel the risks are, and then you make a decision that's informed going forward. Yes? Yes, that's true. That's true. That's true. That is very true. Now, I don't want. I wouldn't want some surgeon that's you know has a watch over his head and is trying to be like NASCAR, you know, because then that's that gets silly, you know. I think you know over two hours is the the time frame that that surgeon is t keeping in mind. There's a study that shows that if the surgery goes over two hours, there's a, r a risk of increased infection. Now, you know, so if you have a complicated knee and the surgeon's being diligent and is spending their time and it's a little over two hours, is that a, something I'd worry about? No, not really. But that's true. And that's one of the reasons why I suggest you go to someone that has experience for that reason. Okay. Now, one she was question. talking, yeah. On the average, how many knee replacements do you do in a year? Oh, gosh, it's hard to tell. I'm young. <laughs> I'm young. I don't have a whole lot of gray hair. So I, I you know. Yeah, it depends on what my credit card bill is. No, you know, I, it, it's been a growing curve for me as I'm starting my practice, and my numbers are going up. When I trained, I did 1,000 that year. And each year, it's getting busier here, too. But I don't think I ever have aspirations of doing 1,000 in a year. What about 300? Yeah, I think that's a reasonable number. You know, three to five to 600 a year. Is that what you do now? I don't know. I don't know what my numbers are. I don't think they're that high, because my practice is just starting out. You know, so I need to meet nice people like you guys and sign them up. No, but it's, you know, the numbers are, are about that, you know, where I do a number of joints in a day and, and we'll just have to see. When you do 1,000 and a, you're doing 10 joints in a day, which is what I did in Chicago, 
it gets to be almost too much. You're running from room to room. Somebody else is closing, and it becomes a little bit difficult. Okay, let's see. I know we're getting close to the end of our time here, so I'm going to try and speed the minimally invasive surgery. Um, I already told you what the idea is. It's more of a concept than an actual fact. It's an idea. The incisions are smaller. You can see on the right there, it's hard to tell on, on the screen here, but it used to be about three times the size, and now they're a smaller incision, but I will tell you 100% it's what you do underneath the skin that makes the difference. So the potential is for less blood loss, less need of blood transfusion, quicker recovery, happier patients, more normal motion. Is that the truth? Yes, it is true that minimally invasive surgery is great. There's less blood transfusions. People get better quicker. But in about eight months to a year, you're doing the same, no matter if you make a, a huge maximally invasive surgery or a minimally invasive surgery. So for the short period of time, it does help you. And I like to get people better quicker. Uh, I'm going to go past this. This is one of my, the marketing things you hear about, the, the woman's knee and all this other stuff. I won't even talk about this. Um, so that's knee. Anything else on knees? Knees, yes. Um, two questions. Mm -hmm. Do you use a, a computer to assist you in the alignment of the knee? Uh, you can. No, do I personally? Do it. No. You don't? No. And Dupuis has a new method up where they x-ray you and then send the x-ray back to their shop and they give you templates. Mm -hmm. Well, they don't x-ray you. They, they either do an MRI or a CT scan of you. Right. And then they say that that's even better than the computer assist because there's less uh, blood and it's a quicker recovery. Is that? Do you believe that? Well, the way they tell me, yeah, it makes sense. It's, it's, a, it's enticing. You know, nowadays we're looking at trying to rein in cost of medicine. And the way I'll equate knee replacements to you is when you go buy your shoes, what is that? I don't even know what it's called, that sizer where it measures your width. And, what's it called? <laughs> a template? Well, I don't even know. There's got to be a, a fancy name for it. I don't know what it's called. But we all know it. You stand in it, and you measure it, and then you get a couple sizes, and you try them on, and one feels right, one feels wrong. And depending on who you have, where you go, the guy may be helpful or not helpful in helping you with that. Because they're from different manufacturers, but this is from one manufacturer. You're right. Knows exactly what he's doing. You're right. But my, what I will tell you is you don't need a CT scan to get a new shoe. No, but my leg does. <laughs> I don't think it makes a difference. I personally don't. I think when you weigh in the cost of all these extra procedures, these, these uh, personalized cutting guides, which is what they're marketing. All the companies have them. It's not just, just a pew. Every one of them has it as an option. And it sounds pretty neat. Is it necessary? No. It's an unnecessary expense for the most part. Yeah, now, their insurance pays for it, so who cares? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Still insurance. You know, is it, is it helpful? Does it benefit you in the long run, in the short run, during the surgery? No. With Dr. Kilgore, we went with Dr. Kilgore for this, and he believes, even though he does 500 knee replacements every year, uh -huh. he still uses computer assist because he can make a mistake. And that's to avoid making any mistakes. He doesn't rely on it totally, but it just helps him keep the leg in line. I think he's, he's a very smart doctor, and I think there's a lot of reasons for using it. And sometimes I would even consider it if it was a, a very bad abnormality. But you can do all those same things on the fly in the operating room without all the other expenses. So it's, a, it's a, a debate. Let's just put it that way. You ask me what I think, and I don't think it matters, personally. I think it's an unnecessary expense. But I'm sure it, it's, it's a good idea. Any other questions about knees? OK. Hip arthritis. So it's basically the same thing. We talked a little bit about it. I think we're getting close to the end of the time, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about hip. Other than, let's get past this. Post-op. So these are the issues with knee and hip replacements. And the biggest one that I could tell you is, aside from the leg length problems, is the infections and wound problems. And we all have heard at least a little bit about problems with blood clots 
and we have to put you on some sort of poison to keep your blood thinner after surgery. Now a side effect of that is it makes your blood thin, which we want, right? It can make the wound drain, it can make a higher risk of infection if you're draining for a long period of time, and so we have to weigh the blood thinning with the wound healing, and that's kind of a balancing act that we all have to do. Um, so there's what different blood thinners out there. There's some that use pills, there's some that use aspirin, there's some that give you injections. And it, you know, at the end of the day, there's, it's, again, it's a decision that you'll make with your doctor. There's these squeezers that they put on your legs at the time of surgery, which also helps a little bit. But the best thing that you can do to minimize your risks is to get up and walk. That alone will take care of most of the issues. We like for you to get up, assuming everything goes well, there's no issues with surgery, to get up and walk right away. I like my patients to put all the weight they can on it right away. If they're having surgery in the morning, they're up that afternoon. It's the best thing in the world for you. It reduces the pain. It makes the blood clots less. It makes you feel better. So that's what we like to do. I'm going to make, this is a very busy slide, the next one, and I'm not going to talk a whole lot about, about it other than pain management after surgery is, is very um, complicated. And it requires a partnership of, of the orthopedic surgeon and the anesthesiologist. And there's a lot of ways we can make you feel better, quicker. Um, let's get past that. So, you know, there, uh, there's a couple other things, the little tricks that you can give and different medications that may or may not work. And I like to kind of whittle out what may work before we do surgery. And I think that's a good idea. Drains, you know, some doctors use drains in the hips and the knees. Some people will give you this auto transfusion. I think there's about a 30% to 33% risk of needing a blood transfusion, no matter what you use. So that's important to know about, and everyone has their own feelings on that. Some doctors will ask you to donate your own blood, some don't. It doesn't matter, you know, aside from the visceral response of getting a blood transfusion, and everybody feels differently about it. What I will tell you about the auto transfusion is it does lower your, your blood levels before surgery, so there's certainly a higher risk of needing a blood transfusion afterwards. Is that more prominent for the hips and the knees, the blood loss? Um, not really. It's about the same. So every doctor, I wouldn't listen to this talk about what your post-operative pro protocol is going to be because every doctor is different. Some will have you partial weight bearing. There's different restrictions. So these are all variable. But everyone's asking, you know, um, what my post-operative expectations should be. And I think I can give you a couple of different things. And <laughs> this is my favorite part of the talk. She's in every one of my talks. I don't care if I'm talking. It doesn't matter what I'm talking about. She just has to be in it. So what are you, what are you going to be doing afterwards? I hope you're not going to be doing that afterwards, but what you're going to be doing is getting up and walking, first of all. Like I said, for hip replacement, that's your only goal, to walk. It's very simple. It's easy. Walk. Some people don't need any therapy. They may need to get by with a cane or a walker for a little while, but then they're off and they're on. Knee replacements require work. I call it torture because that's what knee physical therapy is, is it's torture. Um, we're getting you back, getting your motion back. You're probably stiff to begin with, and we need to get some of that motion back. You're home for two weeks, or you're at rehab, or you're in the hospital, wherever you want to be. That's a personal decision. And then you do an additional four to six weeks of, of outpatient physical therapy. In about six weeks, you're going to be about 70% better. Then for the next three months, you'll get that other 30%. So it takes some time. The first six weeks, you get the most improvement, though. And then, you know, everyone has questions about where am I going to go, how am I going to get there, how long am I going to stay there, and everybody's different. So uh, this is not a talk I could have with you as a group. Um, and then getting home, there's all these issues that everybody has, and they're real issues. And the very least of it is cost. How much is it going to cost you to have a joint replacement? I definitely can't tell you that. Everybody has a different deductible, a different copay, different insurance, all these kind of different things that I, I don't have a clue about, which is amazing. It's just amazing how different everything is. I could do three different, the exact same surgery, and as a doctor, I get paid 
vastly different for each one, depending on what the insurances are. It's, it's amazing how complicated it is nowadays. Okay, so in summary, you know, I think we talked about why you may or may not want to have a joint replacement, what some of the risks are, and what some of the benefits are. Um, any other questions about hips and knees? I have yeah. a question. Um, I've had x-rays, and my hip is bone on bone. Mm -hmm. There's days that I cannot walk from you to you. Yeah. But then there's other days that I can, like I can walk with, you know, without as much pain. Is that normal? Yeah. W waxing and waning, better and worse, stiff, not stiff, that's exactly what arthritis is. Good days and bad days, that's the key. And um, if, if you're rested, it, it seems better. And I, mm -hmm. yet I know that if you don't use it, you lose it. I mean, your story, but if I use it, I do lose it. Like, I can't walk. You're in that process of trying, you're in the grieving process is yeah. what I call it. So she's still, you're just still trying to figure out yeah. when to let go of that. <laughs> when you can't do anything, like I can't golf. Yeah. So all those reasons are appropriate to have your hip replaced. But it's a, it's a personal decision. Some people, if I can't golf, I need my hip replaced. Some people, if I can't golf, if I can't walk, and I can't get out the door, I need my hip replaced. Some people, if I can't get out of bed, I need my hip replaced. You know, everybody has a different level. Right. Personal decision. Personal decision, 100%. Yeah, it's always metal on metal. Always metal. On, that by nature, that's what it is. It's a big ball in a big metal socket, and it has wonderful advantages as far as stability, and it has horrible issues for other reasons as far as the metal on metal and potential complications. And when it goes wrong, it goes wrong. When it goes right, it's like the best thing in the world. And there's websites devoted to hip resurfacing where people will just go on for hours about how great of a surgery it is and how you have their life back and all this sort of thing. So, okay, well, nice talking with you all.